Good morning, everyone. Uh, Friday, April 1st, uh, 2022. Uh, we're going to have a, a morning meeting. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. DuPont to say the pledge and Mr. Uh, Lee to say the prayer. Let's stand up face the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you both. First of all, I'd like to ask everybody to please silence your phones. Again, before we get too far down it, if you've got something to say to the jury, please, if you want to come up here and talk, please come fill this card out right over here on the left, uh, my left. Okay, we'll uh, go to um, item number three, uh, Ms. <coughs> Stephanie Rodriguez. Good morning. As you're aware, one of the components of the Fur and Wildlife Festival is the crowning of both a fur queen and Miss Cameron Parish. Our Louisiana Fur and Wildlife Festival queen represents the festival at fairs and festivals throughout the state during her reign. Um, with me today is Talisha Bertrand, who is the president of the Fur Festival, but she is also the director of the Miss Cameron pageant, which is also a component of the Fur Festival. But what I wanted you to know today is that Ms. Cameron Parish is actually the ambassador of Cameron Parish, not only at fairs and festivals, but this particular year with the particular young lady who uh, was um, selected to serve in this capacity, she has some other activities that she does throughout the state. So she'll have the opportunity to, and has already been representing us, on multiple platforms. So I thought it was important for you to know that you do have an ambassador to the parish and we have a, a rather unique and uh, we're very fortunate to have the ambassador that we do this year. And that's Miss Cecily Oliver. Cecily is a senior at Kinder High School, but she's gonna tell you her connection to Cameron Parish and a little bit about what she's doing, not only throughout the state, but she's also traveled to Washington, D.C. on behalf of rural communities. Good morning, I wanna start off by saying thank y'all so much for having me today. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be here and be able to tell y'all a little bit of my roles this year as Ms. Cameron Parish and what I plan to do and my goal for Cameron Parish this year. So as Ms. Stephanie said, I am a senior at Kinder High School. That's not in Cameron Parish, and a lot of people's big question is, so how do you represent Cameron Parish? Well, for those of you that don't know, my grandfather was Galton Boudreaux, and we were fairly close, we were relatively close. Like, I never knew my mom's dad because he passed away at the age of 47 before they had any grandchildren. And my, mom, my mom's mom married Stephen, which is Galton's son. And we've always spent coming to Cameron every Sunday for dinner or going to church with him, and we would always... He always had a love for Cameron Parish, and it really showed in like in me. And I've had this opportunity this year to finally be able to enjoy my love for Cameron Parish and represent it at such a wonderful level. 
So this year, I have been a Louisiana FFA state officer. I serve as the state vice president representing Area 3 this year. I've had the opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C. and advocate for rural broadband and infrastructure access in rural communities like Cameron Parish and other areas across our state. As many of us know, hurricane infrastructure is something that has affected so many, and many of y'all here in Cameron Parish are still dealing with devastation almost two years later after Hurricane Laura. And when I was in Washington, I had the opportunity to advocate for what we need here and really get to talk to our senators about how we need this help and where it's going to help our state. Though this plan can't take off very quickly, it's been, brought, it's been put on a 10-year plan, and we're going to work closely as Louisiana FFA with our senators to get this, push, get this ball rolling and really help those here get the help that they need to help Cameron Parish and other rural communities, because many of us don't have access to internet to help advocate and do things like we need every day. I mean, I honestly don't have phone service right now in Cameron Parish, and it's very hard because coming down here, I was not able to tell my mom that I made it, so she's probably freaking out because she's not home right now. And that's because we don't, T-Mobile's probably not gonna put a tower back down here. They're not pushing because they're so scared because of hurricanes and things like that. But we need to push, the people down here need that. And that they need this help because this, is, this community has so much. Many people don't think of Cameron Parish as something that has stuff, but this is a great tours, tourism option and it has so much to offer for anyone. You know, every weekend when I came down here growing up, it was such a wonderful thing because it's somewhere that you honestly can't explain what you necessarily love about it. It's you love everything. And there's a sense of community that comes over anyone when they enter the parish. I'm not sure if it's just the wonderful people that Cameron Parish has that welcomes everyone and who they are every time you come, or just the wonderful atmosphere and the beautiful nature that we have to offer here. So throughout my next through nine months as Ms. Cameron Parish, I want to advocate for Cameron Parish on the state and national level. And I want to feel that the community has someone that they can speak to if they need help on a national level. So if any of you ever have a question or need someone to help advocate for you, please reach out to me and I will be more than welcome to help you and help you get to where you need. And thank you all so much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the Cameron Parish Tourist Commission helps sponsor her travels as well as promotional items. And we have some being ordered right now that she'll take on the road um, in all of these many trips that she does. And on behalf of the Tourist Commission, I also want to let you know and invite you. You know, we've had a series of uh, lunches with local vendors throughout the parish. We started here. In the, um, in the Courthouse Square in October, and we're gonna wrap up in May. Our next event is in Hackberry on April 23rd at Mainstay Suites, and we always advertise in the camera pilot and get the word out on social media. Derek assists us to a great degree with that, um, but we wanna make sure that you're aware and maybe you can stop by. Our last event, we don't have a date schedule yet, will be in Lowry. But again, thank you for having um, Ms. Cecily Oliver today and, and hearing her story about what she intends to get done. And, and she didn't mention that she is going to be an LSU Tiger in the fall, and she plans to major in agribusiness and agribusiness and mass communications. So um, I think that you'll be hearing from her more than once in the future. So thank you very much for having us today. Thank you. Well, she, she has to make straight A's. She has to. She do, you do? Yeah, you had to because you, you spit that stuff out like you've been knowing it all your life. So, thank you very much. Thank y'all. Okay. Um, we're going to uh, discuss district boundary maps for uh, parish entities. Um, I get this started. Katie? Cool. Is Kristen in here? Yeah, she's here. Kristen. You want to tell them why we would like to have some uh, district boundaries? Uh, maps, please. Put the map. I don't, I don't know. I have no map. You only got two minutes, Kurt, uh, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Oh, well. But the reason that we're asking for this is because. When 
an election comes up for a taxing district to renew or even a new tax, the maps that we have are very old. They do not show roads. They are maps that were made back when, before Miss Suzanne even. And we, since um, y'all have, uh, I can't think of his name right now, hired to do. Cade Cole. Mr. Cade hired to do the maps for the redistricting. We would like him to also supply us with the maps for each taxing district so that we can make sure that when we have these elections that everyone is captured and no one is left out, no one's put in the wrong place, that, you know, might not be, we don't want anyone left out. And it, it's actually the, uh, a law that the entity is supposed to supply the registrar's office with the map. It's just never been enforced, and we've never made a big deal about it. But since they're hired right now, we would like them to also supply those maps to us as well. Okay. Will we need to vote on that, or is it something? Have y'all talked to Katie about it? Yeah, no, we haven't. We have a contract in place. So. We haven't met with him yet about redistricting. We were waiting for the school board to kind of get through with their maps. But absolutely, if you guys want to do that, it has been probably longer than 10 years since we've had any sort oh, of maps least. produced. They're very outdated. And so it's probably past due for us to invest a little money in that anyway. So I'd be glad to make sure that Mr. Cole and the staff work with the Registrar of Voters Office and make sure we capture everything they want on the maps before we um, pay him to produce them and everything. And this will be separate from redistricting. Right. This is just something for taxing districts. Um, this will not impact the redistricting of your of your district. Sure. Do we do we need to move that forward or do, uh, or do you handle that? Oh, I, I, I mean, no, I don't think so. Process. I mean, it's going to come at an added cost once we have the opportunity to meet with Mr. Cole and ask him how much that line item is going to cost. Uh, we'll come back to you and ask for approval for that. Yep. Yeah. There you go. You are good with working on Yeah, because what we have now is like marker and crayon. We look at probably five different maps, too. <laughs> and every other parish has them. They just click on them and print yeah. them, and they're done. Well, you need them too. Yes, we would uh, like I, them very much. <laughs> Mr. President, I, I got a question for her yes, too. Sir. Have you want the boundaries for taxpayers? Anyway, how do y'all go about all the voters in the parish if they still live in the parish? Okay, so say. If we get any kind of mail returned or a subpoena, if they are subpoenaed for jury duty and that is returned, the clerk sends that to us. That voter is put in active and a address confirmation card is mailed to them. If it comes back, then that is two types of correspondence that has been returned. So they are inactive. If they don't send back their address confirmation card confirming that they, they live there, they are left inactive. And after a federal election, they fall off if they do nothing. That is how, that is our only way. And if we, and another thing, say we do get another address from someone, we do check to see if they are homestead at that address. And if they are, we do send them a homestead challenge. Okay, so y'all don't actually go out and look at these addresses where people say they live and they hadn't been living here for the last two or three years or ten years? No, sir. Okay. I mean, we can't pull them unless we get something to say they're not there. Okay. Well, I mean, the census numbers and the voters' numbers don't match up, so that's kind of where... Yeah, they never do. I, I understand that. No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And, and also this... This document we have from uh, the state treasurer is, is, is saying that Cameron Parish has 5,343 uh, occupants. Population. Population. And 
we're pretty sure that's not right. We have 5,500 registered voters, I believe. Now, that's that includes inactive and active. And like I said, it's a process. You can't just remove people. You have to let the... Sure, right. And, and like I said, we do take the extra step. If we get an address from them, say they request a ballot at an address in another parish, we do pull a homestead if yeah. we can. Now, we can't pull them in every parish. Right. Because I did have one last week that I tried. They had just registered, and they put their mailing address as another parish, but that, that assessor's website doesn't supply you with a homestead exemption. So, so real quick, uh, for, a, for a registered voter, do they have to have a domicile, or do they just have to own they property have to be and be registered in, in only one parish? parish? They have to be homestead, so they have to have a domicile. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> they can't be homestead in another parish. Yeah, domicile in their name. And now, if it's if they are in Texas, there's there's no way of knowing that. But they could be a renter also. I mean, they did. But yeah, they, you could be a renter. Yeah, <laughs> if you don't have a homestead, you don't have a homestead. You know, you, you think about kids who just move out sure. and are renting. You know, they don't. They can keep their homestead at their parents. All right. Any more questions? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. We'll move on to the green cards. Uh, Mr. Craig Broussard. Craig Broussard, Holly Beach, uh, representing the Beach Development District 1. Just wanted to give you a quick update from uh, the last time I was here on the progress we've been making on the Causeway boat launch. Uh, it's been significant. Uh, we've finished all the grading, picking up the trash. We've got the uh, boards uh, replaced on the boat launch. We weren't able to get fireproof boards, Sonny, but uh, <laughs> we, have, we have notified the police. They're on the lookout for that old lady burning the, the fire. So uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we, took care, we, did that. we took care of that as best as possible. We have, uh, through the gracious, uh, Donations of uh, Chenier and Jeff Davis and others. Uh, we they've uh, we've gotten a little under a dozen poles strung out with the lines, uh, with security lighting out there. It's it's now on. I, I was there when they strung up the lights and the wires. We've also got um, uh, well, portalettes will be there. The dumpster was already there. We've done the cleanup. Let's see what the sign. The sign has been installed. Uh, the only thing remaining before the ceremony on the 28th of this month, Thursday, 10 a.m., will be some landscaping. We're going to uh, put some rock in, uh, paved stones to where it'll be a flat surface in case people want to, you know, take their boys or sons or whatever and uh, stand in front of the sign, take pictures, and and that's what we're hoping for is for it to draw interest. Uh, overall, uh, the project is significantly under budget and ahead of schedule. The original budget was $12,000 to be completed before, on or before Memorial Day, and it, uh, we're going to greatly exceed that due to a lot of extremely good help from uh, the departments here in Cameron Parish helping out and, and a really big, uh, big push. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely pleased by everybody's willingness to help. I mean, this is, uh, Louisiana is Sportsman's Paradise, and these are one of our best showcases to show off the state. And uh, really proud of how everybody's come together to make this uh, a huge success. We're hoping to have uh, the Lieutenant Governor, our favorite state representative, and uh, a lot of other people. Y'all are all invited. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. <laughs> so, any questions? Hopefully, uh, hopefully we will stop all the uh, people dumping their trash down there and piling stuff up. We, we uh, talked to yeah. I, we've got plans. Uh, if one, if, if we've got a plan A and a plan B, so we are going to. Uh, I was extremely disappointed 
the day we, we did the, the, the beach cleanup, uh, not the beach, but the, the road cleanup and the boat launch cleanup, I went into town, got some groceries. On the way back, I stopped, and the, <laughs> there was a guy fishing, and at the, at the foot, at his base of his foot was a bear can. So I was kind of highly disappointed since there was a, a dumpster right there. But the, uh, we're, I'm trying to get the no littering signs changed out to the ones that actually show the uh, consequences uh, to where they understand uh, what, what they're facing. I mean, it's, it, it's, there's no excuse for the littering in that, on that boat launch. You've got it. Not, not whatsoever. Yeah, there's none whatsoever. So I think until we start uh, issuing some citations and the word gets out, uh, you know, it, it'll quickly resolve itself. Well, uh, one of the problems is, is people dumping their household garbage in there from different areas. Correct. And not our state, so. We have that problem also in Holly Beach as well. So hopefully uh, we can stop that as well. And I'll work with you and, I, and the rather, rest of uh, y'all to, to get that done. So uh, when this project ends up, I'm, I'm hoping to jump to the next one. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Take care. Thank you, sir. We have uh, Donnie, Edgar, Daniel. Daniel, yes, yes sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the council, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this morning. You guys own a track of land. It's 0.6 acres at uh, Old Crab Lady Landing. Uh, first of all, a little bit about myself. I'm the owner of St. Mary Seafood and Louisiana Bait Products. Uh, at at St. Mary Seafood, I've been in business for 35 years, buying crabs, crawfish, fish, and Louisiana Bait Products. I started that project about nine years ago, uh, supplying pretty much all over the country with bait. And uh, certainly this year is the first time that I ran out of bait in the country, basically ran out of bait. It's just a challenge uh, at that company. I just don't have enough freezer storage to hold enough bait to go through the closed season. But, but that's a little bit about myself and what I'd like to do, you guys own a, a small piece of property at Old Crab Lady Landing and I'd like the opportunity to lease it from you to you know, to try to buy crabs and whatever I can. If the good Lord's willing and I do pretty good, then I'd like to put some kind of facility there, sell bait or whatever I can. Um, but I have talked to one of the neighbors, there's, there's four small, very small tracks right there. Already talked to the closest neighbor to you, Miss Bear. And she's kind of, it's owned by two people. She's contacting the other person that lives in Nevada. So, you know, I'd like the opportunity to continue with this project, do some research real quick. If you guys would be willing to lease it to me, I'll um, supply liability insurance, whatever your requirements are, you know, I'll certainly comply. Then I'll give me a chance to fix the road, put some limestone, clean it up. There is a small shed there. The Hurricanes knocked the roof off and it's just a post left. But I like the opportunity to clean it up and try. If you guys would be willing to let me have it. To start with, ain't you a movie star? Well, I'm a- You an alligator man? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a commercial fisherman from Bayou Blue. That's right. <laughs> the movie right. star part. Well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, yeah. Yes, sir. I watch it many, many times. I just hope I, I said, don't. I said, I said earlier. <laughs> I said I don't know where I've seen that guy before, but, I but I've seen guy. him before. Yeah. Judo. Yeah. Yes, sir. Judo. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I hope I don't disappoint our state. You know, representing you know, my parish and and the people. You know, uh, that show's done quite a bit for Louisiana, especially sure. the alligator industry. Yeah. It's helped us some. And, and I'm fortunate that 
me and my family's part of it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, somebody want to talk about that? That uh, piece of property was acquired back, uh, I think, for Hurricane Rita uh, Road Home property. Uh, and I don't have an objection to leasing that because I don't have, uh, I don't think we have any plans to do anything with it. Uh, I don't have a that's problem in Butch, it, yeah. it's, it's in Butch's district. Yeah, uh, I'm all for it. Thank you. I think Thank we... Uh, have you get with our? Uh, mm -hmm. We can move that forward if you like. Uh, Let Katie get with Katie uh, legal and get a yeah. lease drawn up. And yeah, once we get, um, we'll get with, like I said, legal and negotiate the terms of the lease with Mr. Daniel, and we'll bring it back to you for authority to sign. That'll there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Thanks. Chair, I got. I, I do yes, have sir. a question for him. Hold Mr. on, Mr. Daniel. Yes, sir. I, I do have a couple questions here. Yes, sir. What are, are you looking at leasing the property adjacent to it, or are you looking at buying the property? Well, I mean, if it's for sale and the price is right, I'll buy it. Okay. But first, I would like the opportunity just to see how much business I get. I already have some crab fishermen that have cut. Well, they've been for years trying to get me to come over here for years. Okay. And finally, I said, look. Let me see if I can get a piece of property. I'll come. But but certainly, you know, I've been at St. Mary Seafood 35 years, and my phone number's never changed. Owners never changed. Um, if, if I'd like to get there and get started, and if it looks like I can be successful, I'll make you proud. Trust me. Okay. I'm good. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, I, I don't want to be the one to break the record such a short meeting. Um, does anybody Katie have any talked yet? Uh -huh. Katie hasn't talked yet. Uh, that's true, but uh, I do want to uh, say thank you to uh, Johnson Bayou uh, Road Crew for the work they done across the, the ferry, clean up that mess and people are making. So that we can't get stopped. Uh, but please pass that on. Sure will. Yeah. And uh, not only that, but the work they're doing in Little Florida. Yes. They're doing a great job. People, are, The people are very pleased with them. So uh, I'd like to thank them, too. Sure will. And also I want to pass on to you that uh, the, the all-storage site in Hackberry is fixing to do some uh, a lot of work and they're going to be moving a lot of cement, and hopefully that'll be a, another additive to your project down there. So, okay. And I'm talking to them now, so we'll, we'll see. Okay? Uh, I see we're cutting grass already, dishes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Or we're going to spray them. We ain't got a spray truck. Or we're going to buy one? If we can buy them, one, to bid on. I mean, I'd be... You know, I think yeah, I, I to, talked to one company, uh, but he says, I know everything's expensive and the price and of fuel is really expensive. You don't furnish a truck, so it's going to take a while to get a truck. So it probably won't be till next summer. Well, we just got to push on. What's wrong with the one we have now? We lost it for the storm. It was inside uh, the barn. Okay. It wouldn't be cheaper to buy one on uh, a spur rig on the trailer and use one of our trucks to pull it. But you can mm -hmm. get a, you can get an awful large strip spray rig. I can check on. I like check because I mean, it's a, it holds up a lot longer than cutting grass every two weeks. Yeah, I mean, uh, some spray rigs are are, are uh, very expensive and very no. tedious. Yeah, we went to Calcasieu and looked at theirs, and then Susie and them went where they built them and looked at them. She can't get one. I'm just. He said it's gonna be a while. I'll be in line. <laughs> Stay in line and keep the grass cut. I guess that's the yeah, uh, object of it. and see what's the timeline now. Thank you. I have a question. With that, I do have something else I'd like to talk about before okay. Katie starts. We had an issue uh, at home with a, a ambulance placing. And uh, we don't have it. It's not public policy. We don't have a zoning ordinance in this parish. 
But anytime we site, move, build a new uh, public building, I'd like to make it a policy that we contact a, a surrounding uh, homeowners so that they have the opportunity to say yay or nay. Now, it's not saying it because one person says no, it doesn't happen, but it gives everybody a chance to voice their opinion and be heard. And uh, that's all most people want anyway. So uh, is, is, is there a way to get that in there? Uh, maybe we have to ask Tom. I don't know. Is there a way to get that in there without zoning? Tom? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were asking Katie or asking me. You're talking uh, deer in the headlights. Yeah, yeah I know. My <laughs> policy's fine. Um, sure, notice to the surrounding, you know, uh, property owners in the event that, you know, the parish or a board is going to purchase property. Uh, we may need to, it would be case by case on, you know, in our parish what surrounding neighbors means. And, you know, in some cases that may be, uh, 50 feet or you know or a quarter of a mile um, but but I think making the board aware of contacting people in, in, the, in the area uh, is, is a good start yeah. yeah now let me ask you another question again I know we're not zoned but it brought up something else to me so suppose somebody wanted to come in here and build a hog farm or I'm just using that as a uh, uh, if they wanted to come next to the school for example I mean, is there any way without zoning to, to be able to, to? Not really. We, we, we had 12, 15 years ago, we had an issue with uh, waste disposal, something the other somebody wanted to do here in the parish. And, you know, Cecil, the DA at the time, fought it pretty hard and were able to stop it. But it was really just the, the, uh, the legal posturing of us just making it difficult on those, on that business of trying to plan it. Ultimately, they would have prevailed, and because we don't have any zoning or any limitations, but what may be at the state level, as far as that particular business was a disposal site, so it had some state regulations that caused them some, some, uh, some problems. Uh, but locally, no. We generally we don't unless there's a subdivision that has subdivision restrictions that are particular to that subdivision, generally, no, we don't have any uh, any way of stopping, uh, for instance, in Grand Lake, two doors down from me, they're opening a hardware store. I, I don't have a problem with it, and actually, some people called me about a year ago and just asked me about it. Um, but if I had objected, there's nothing I could have done. And I, and I don't know if I want to make but That's it. just an example. Yeah. I'm just saying, we, we don't. We don't have any... Uh, recourse or a property owner does not have a recourse to limit the activity on his neighbor's property basically yeah. now, I just wanted to make that everybody aware of that because they could want to come and put an adult <coughs> entertainment or anything and we have no recourse if I'm understanding there, there's some state again so, some business activities have state regulations but at a local level we do not you know, and I think we like it uh, and that is no that that's that's the way that we I think our parish prefers it to be because that also allows you to use the property your own property as you desire again within the parameters of, of, of the law um, so that's and that is that's the way now I think it's still a, probably a good policy for public bodies and boards to, to let the neighbors of the community know that we're making these plans and come to a meeting to express your concerns or issues. But uh, at the end of the day, we don't have any regulations to stop that activity. Uh, now we would, you know, again, we're a public body, so we'll probably be more receptive to the public when they have comments and concerns, but a business owner or a property owner, a private property owner, doesn't have to be. Okay, and just to be clear, the Eminence Board did nothing wrong. They followed the law. They followed the procedures in place. Uh, it's just sad that it comes to a misunderstanding like that, and there's hard feelings. So if we do this up front, maybe we can avoid that in the future. Yeah, in that particular case, we're talking about the ambulance district number two acquiring some property in Johnson Bayou. Um, you know, in order to get to the point of acquiring it, there were public meetings that the board had to make the decision, had to discuss it. What are we going to do? So it was discussed and, and, and done public meetings to ultimately get to the point of acquiring the property. It's just that we did not have in place a policy 
that you know uh, are, hadn't had this issue come up before where boards you know were asked to notify the neighbors or the surrounding uh, community of the intentions which we will going forward okay well I appreciate you checking in that sure. yeah. but they would have to I mean to do I mean you could do it as a policy huh? yeah it's just it, a policy do it in a policy but wouldn't you want it before they acquired the property yeah, so that, I think that's the, that's the point. But they're going through it now. No, that, that, that deal is done. Done. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you don't wait in the policy, you don't put in the policy to notify the adjacent owners that we're going to build a building here after the fact that they've done bought the property. No, that, that's, that's, I think that's the point that Sonny's making is that cool. the board would notify the the property owners in advance saying these are our intentions these are our right. plans please come to the meeting and talk to us about it before we acquire so, the property before we build something they don't do none of that now they just acquire a property they don't <coughs> that, talk about the acquiring uh, have no they have no, no, that, it, it, no they have the, there's no policy procedure or or rule of law that says a public entity has to notify the surrounding okay. neighbors or, or, or property owners of their uh intention to uh, build to buy or, or build some use of property yeah we, we you know the, this ambulance district has acquired already two pro one in grand lake and one in big lake because those their structures were destroyed up there so they've already acquired it. and again and both of them are on residential streets uh, <clears throat> and again the, they went through the process but there was no policy in place or legal requirement to notify the property owners um, but now we will, we will implement that yeah. policy. <coughs> Thanks. That's all, all I got. Right. Anybody else want to go to staff? Katie? I promise to be brief. I sure. just wanted to um, touch on the election that we are asking you to call today on our voting meeting. Um, we talked about it last month, but I just kind of wanted to go in just maybe a little bit more detail. It is agenda item of 19, oh no, 18. And so currently as it stands, you have a health unit tax that is a parish-wide tax, and that health unit tax is the building next to us in the square. It does <coughs> serve or it is it's supposed to serve the entire parish. That's why the entire parish pays for that tax. Now, we understand that typically, you know, now that the health unit in Lake Charles, they have satellite offices in Sulphur, so typically not some by you in Hackberry or driving into Sulphur, it's closer to them than to come to Cameron. And then Grand Lake um, has access to a health unit in Lake Charles. It's closer to them than to come to Cameron. So right now, it's, it's still servicing a community, but a very small population. So um, it's typically overfunded as well. We have a very um, a, a authority to levy a very high tax to run it. And right now, um, it only takes about $150,000 a year for maintenance on it. Um, the other tax you currently have is a courthouse and jail tax. And when that tax was passed, it's parish-wide. Everybody in the parish pays for it, and it goes only to maintain the courthouse and the jail. That is the only thing you can use it for. What I'd like for you to consider is to take that health unit tax and that courthouse and jail tax, and instead of levying those two taxes, get rid of those and have one new consolidated tax. So the members of your community will not be paying any more in taxes. It's just going to be better distributed throughout the parish. Because instead of all of that funds being saved right here in the courthouse square just for these buildings, <coughs> now we would be able to pay for things in Johnson Bayou for this boat launch that Mr. Craig was talking about. We'd be able to help pay for things in Hackberry. For, you know, we have a boat launch there. We have one in Grand Lake. Um, we have a uh, jetty pier if we reopen it. We have things throughout every community that can <coughs> benefit from those tax dollars that are just sitting in account, surplus, not being spent. So that's what I'm asking for you guys to do today. And like I said, it's, it's important that people know they are not paying any more taxes. 
they are taxes are just being distributed throughout the entire community the entire parish instead of just right here in the courthouse square paying for governmental buildings and so just to give you the numbers if you combine it you would generate 1.6 million dollars in revenue and it only takes right now 1.3 million to pay for every building that we currently have parish-wide that's not just the courthouse and jail and health unit i pulled the east annex west annex all these uh, boat launches and everything that we have the county ag building in grand lake um, we're building that new north cameron eoc in grand lake um, the boat launches in hackberry and like i said at the causeway so right now we typically spend 1.3 million dollars on those buildings so with the additional 300,000 that we would be able to collect, we could e either <coughs> back the tax and save the taxpayer dollars, or you could dedicate that to a new project somewhere, anywhere in the parish, whether it's economic development, if it's building a rec center, if it's building whatever it is you guys want to do with it, you would have a little bit of surplus funds to divvy up to spend in your community. So that's what that is. You're just voting to call the election. The election would happen in November and it would go to your voters and we, they would decide whether or not um, they would be supportive of it. So worst case scenario, it fails, no harm done, you still have your health unit tax to pay for health unit, you still have your courthouse tax, that would, be, that would have to be renewed at a later date. So you would still be able to pay for those two buildings. This is just something we want to do preemptively before those renewals come up to see if we could better spend these taxpayer dollars. So, where does all the money come from now for the boat launches and the stuff that our general adding? fund? It comes out of general fund. It comes out of our general fund. So, so if we combine these two taxes for maintenance, parish wide for all this other stuff, and it's saving three hundred thousand dollars a year, it's actually saving about six hundred thousand because you take that money out of the general fund. Exactly. Yeah. So it's possible we could roll back some of our taxes to you know, save people the pair some money yes sir in the event of doing this absolutely of getting it passed yes sir okay that'd be a great thing to do is especially combining money that's just sitting in the bank and you can't use it but with, for one building right and you can spend send it pairs wide the best uh, and save money the best thing we can do is to educate the public mm -hmm. Make sure they understand what, what we're trying to do is not trying to hurt, retax somebody or do more taxes. We just want to better the, the system of the go, uh, spreading out the money in different areas. Yes, sir. It's it's just tax reform. It's not new taxes. It's just restructuring. Yeah. And Mr. Kirk's been on me for a long time <laughs> about town hall meetings. And this is the, the hot topic, and Two years now, huh? we are going to have that, I promise you, Mr. Kirk, but we wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to, to do this tax reform so we could make this the leading topic of it. And invite Mr. Boyock to come, our state rep, to talk about the Grand Lake Pontoon Bridge. Yes, sir. Uh, and the ferry. And the ferry. And the ferry. <laughs> the president and the one and all the one. The ferry that need captains. The ferry runs. It's some qualified captains to run it need that uh, roads that's what money could be used on uh, on our roads well yes. the next tax is for roads so also on the agenda just not to get it confused you do have your renewal for your road and bridge tax that is also and you have to call the election mm -hmm. it will also happen in november but it's a renewal it's not a new tax and it is just to fund road and bridge it generates uh 2.9 million um, but it's it's underfunded. Um, we the general fund has to subsidize it with about a, a million and a half every year to keep it from More going like in a deficit. Mm -hmm. So that that is one of uh, an instance where we didn't authorize a high enough tax, um, but we're capped at this, and so we just have to subsidize with our general fund dollars. And it's always have been to that way. Because the public demands the services they get right now. Mm -hmm. They like yes. that. Yes. <coughs> and it's just so, steadily going up with the price of gas and fuel. Yeah. Right it is. Well, it was probably more than enough money. when it was passed by the electors, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, 
one one of the things that we can do we do to education is, is to let them know that with the taxable entities we have now a small tax goes a long ways in Paris wide so we, we may not have to raise it much but would bring in a lot more funding for our road and bridges with the new facilities we have well and not only that the consolidation of the entities has been happening in the recent past <coughs> years also I think we ought to continue with that down the road Consolidate more we can, you know. I, I yes. think it helps. Uh, yeah, I think it helps uh, a lot of the uh, parishes that don't have that big tax uh, revenue source. In my opinion. And we get a lot of questions about well, what happens to the money that was collected in the the original tax. And that stays in its own maintenance account. So whatever was collected for the health unit and the courthouse jail still can only be spent there. So that's just going to be something that Kayla is going to manage and how she you knows she's going to have her restricted accounts just for the old money for health unit, just the old money in courthouse and jail, and any new money is going to go into a, a different new account and be spent parish wide. It's going to make her job a little more complicated, but she doesn't. I'm good. She's so happy. <laughs> How's the road royalty money coming? Better? Worse? Uh, yeah, I can look and see, but it's still, it's down. I know. I mean, I don't know about, I hadn't received the one for February yet, so that one might be up. It's still not what it was. Years ago. Four, it went from 4 million to 600,000 Yeah, less a than a million. So, um, so that's really all I, I was going to talk to you guys about. Unless you have any questions for me, um, I, I am prepared to give an update on some federal funding and stuff if you want to hear those numbers. You had money from Mr. Clay Higgins? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So we get a lot of calls about um, Mr. Congressman Clay Higgins. Uh, his press releases stir up a lot of controversy for you guys and so I want to kind of clarify what that is so um, FEMA public assistance dollars they are a reimbursement program so when you spend the money FEMA reimburses you well Congressman Higgins office asked FEMA to supply him with large allocations reimbursement allocations because he likes to to do press releases saying that these parishes got this money and to be clear, it is reimbursement. It, it's not a blank check to go do hurricane recovery however you please. It is reimbursing you for money you've, you've already spent out of your own pocket. And so a lot of people see um, Calcasieu Parish awarded $30 million for debris removal. And City of Lake Charles, $500 million for mm -hmm. debris removal. Um, that's just something that is money they already spent. Um, he's only reported on Cameron Parish once, and it's when we got our debris removal money. And so I, I talked to his office about that, and they tell FEMA, you know, um, anything over this threshold, report it to us. Well, they have probably a pretty high threshold because they don't want to report that Cameron Parish got $14,000 for hurricane mitigation on the courthouse in jail. So they're not reporting a lot of the money that we're getting, and, um, but, so, but it doesn't mean we're not getting money. So, to date, FEMA public assistance dollars, we've received $37.4 million in PA funding. Um, CWG funding, which is this disaster funding, they just allocated, Congress just allocated an additional amount. So, it is up to $1.5 billion that is going to be used, um, that was given to the state of Louisiana for hurricane recovery. The thing with CDBG funds is the state gets it and then the state decides how they're going to allocate it. So we actually went to a few meetings, uh, Mr. Curtis and I, Mr. Butch, um, a few weeks ago talking about their action plan, how they're going to decide which parishes get and how much. What they are wanting to do is just cover your non-federal cost share. So FEMA gives you right now 90% of your money back and you're supposed to pay for the rest, eat the other 10%, well, what the state of Louisiana wants to do is give the CDBG funds to cover that 10%. So essentially, 
everything would be covered 100% for all of our eligible recovery projects, which is a really good thing. So we're only going to get as much money as we get in FEMA dollars. And that's just the way the formula is. Um, a lot of that's uh, based off of your, your disaster numbers. And we were very fortunate governmental-wise. We didn't have a lot of damage compared to Calcasieu and City of Lake Charles and even Boulevard Parish. We didn't have as much high dollar, $500 million damages to our buildings like they did. So we're going to receive less money just because we weren't damaged as much. We're not claiming for as much FEMA funds. So that's how that works. Now we did get $9.4 million of hazard mitigation funds. And that is what you guys allocated directly to elevation and reconstruction projects. So um, those applications have been submitted to FEMA. Um, the last time we talked to them was in October of 2021. I've been working with Congressman Higgins' office um, for the last three months uh, trying to put pressure on them to see why the applications are stalled at FEMA headquarters. Um, we did get a little bit of headway um, Hunt and Giat are our, our, our management firm and the problem that's been holding this up is because typically when you get a hazard mitigation grant it's two to three years after the storm. Well the state of Louisiana tried to do a really good thing and say we're not going to make you wait three years we're going to give you the money now. Do your application get in we're going give it to you to give it to you now. The hiccup is that all of the um, proof of loss, like all your documentations of your homes that you're going to elevate, are all damaged <laughs> because it was two months after the storm. So it's getting called at FEMA headquarters. You have someone in Washington, D.C. looking at a picture of a, a home two months after Hurricane Laura, Laura with the blue tarp and saying, well, we, we're going to elevate it. Who's going to fix the roof? And that's where it's getting bogged down, and it's not anyone's fault but FEMA's fault right now. Um, so we had a call yesterday. We have another call scheduled, um, supposed to be for next week, and we're going to get Higgins' office involved again to put pressure on them to get these applications processed because now we're 18 months in, coming up on two years, and the money's sitting there waiting for FEMA to approve the application. And there's a lot of homeowners I know that are frustrated. It wasn't supposed to take this long. And we sent out a letter to everyone over the last few weeks saying, look, we didn't forget about you. Your application is at FEMA, be embedded. We're just waiting on them to approve it. Please just be patient. I know um, two years is too long, but we just, we're doing the best we can. And uh, we have to get Higgins involved he, he's he likes to walk around and, and shout at people so he used to let him know and he'll go in there and, and tighten them up he said so we'll see. so uh the only other funding i know kara uh, it's just state that's all federal dollars now we're talking about state dollars we received three hundred thousand dollars in cash directly from the state of louisiana um Thank you, Ryan Boyock, our representative, for that. He made sure he followed at the state level. He gave that to us, and that was just to do, that was a blank check. You go do disaster recovery <coughs> in your area, and whatever you think you need to do, it's yours. Here's your money. And um, we also have that uh, $2 million state capital outlay grant to build our North Cameron EOC that we're working through. So we've even received state money for recovery. So that is all of our funding in a nutshell. What about, uh, you were talking about, the, uh, I'm looking here about the seven multiple sites to be cleaned up, the P property, private property, PPD, PPD or whatever. Water. Is that? Oh, no, sir. Is, that is a, a substantial completion for we demoed seven governmental buildings. Oh. <coughs> it's just that they've been demoed and hauled off and we're just accepting it is complete. Didn't we have seven sites approved we were supposed to start clearing for the PPDR? There was 26. I think we're, huh? we're up to 26. That, how many PPDR properties have they approved so far, Danny? Right now, this is the debris, the one that needs to debris clean up. We have like 34 properties that are eligible for the program. Now we're still going through the process of demolition on the homes. That's still being vetted by FEMA. Um, 
We already had third, uh, 34, 35 people already withdrew the application. They already did the demo and stuff. Still. So you know how it is dealing with payment. You just have to wait. They're not fast. Uh, we do have other issues where the survivors are not providing all the documentation to complete the process. I got Casey tracking them now five times, three times. Now, I'm at the point where if you don't want to get it done, just we can, we can stop because right. we spend a lot of time emailing and uh, she goes around the Grand Lake, Hackberry, upload the documents for themselves. So we are moving forward, it's just not fast enough. And when you're going for federal dollars, you got to go by their requirements and, and you know, the only way to speed it up is if you decide to forget payment and pay for it for yourself. That's the only uh, option. But so it's, it's real costly. So we're trying to do it where it's, it costs us very little money to get this project done. Right. Do but all together we'll have under 100 properties. Do huh? we have any approvals to start cleaning yet? We don't have a contractor. Uh, we, haven't got, we don't have enough information for a contractor to, to give us a quote okay. to do the bid process. We have the debris cleanups. Uh, they are, we know who they are. Now we're still going to the houses because that each property has to be surveyed. There's a lot of different criteria for each property, right. and it's taking a little bit longer to vet. So we started with the debris first because it's quicker and less moving parts to go with these. Um, once we get enough numbers, then Katie can take. We can do a bid package and and, and go forth. With this that. will be bid out to the to who? Anybody who's anyone? We're going to do this time around. We're going to list a. a provide a map of potential properties and we are going to bid it per structure. It's going to be sealed bids. So they will give us a lump sum per single wide trailer, double wide trailer, a stick built home. They'll have a list of all the different types and they will bid on it per structure and there'll be a lump sum bid. Okay. We did have one small success this week in their stalling tactics though. Uh, they wanted to go backwards and have physical signatures for all of the right of entries. FEMA was trying to require this. Um, and we sat down with HGA in the very beginning of the process to make sure that the electronic signatures was going to be acceptable. FEMA has already accepted those for other disasters. We pointed that out to them this week uh, and told them how much more time that that was going to require of us to get all of these individuals to come back in, do signatures again, and they finally conceded that the digital ones would be good. Now, in your own district, you realize you have some properties that are damaged. Now, they didn't apply. We reached out to, and some of them don't want to apply for it. Uh, now, the jury, y'all can take action and do kind of late, you know, condemn the place and so yeah. forth, but what you're going to do after that? So we're trying to invite everybody that wants to get it done. Now, we did have a deadline, okay, that was back in October. And we, as of yesterday, we had some more applicants. I don't turn them down because they say they're being referenced by y'all. Now, we did have some drop out of the program, but each time we have a new applicant, that just delays the process a little bit longer because you got to do surveys, you got to get it vetted, and uh, probably in the last month, we probably had an extra 15 people. So, FEMA doesn't move that quickly. And we're trying to get a good draft on so the contractor could have put a very good bid on it. Even if we have a few stragglers at the end, we can probably adjust the cost. So we're still working on it, and it's moving, but it's not moving fast. Okay. Y'all getting calls on the FEMA trailer for the rental? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, as far as the uh, FEMA Your rental, Daniel, it Daniel, started today. Daniel, come to the mic to talk about this. <laughs> well, you got a question? No, well, no everybody needs to talk into your mic so they, if, if this is all being recorded and if you watched it, you can't hardly hear it, so please step in to the mic and speak. Thank you. Okay, I'm done, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, today is April 1st, the rent has started today for the FEMA uh, housing. Uh, by now, everybody has been reached out by letter or notified in person about the rent's going to start. You know, the process. They start off with the rent. You, it goes from a uh, travel trailer, six hundred bucks. One bedroom is eight hundred eighty-four dollars. Three bedrooms, eleven hundred dollars, and four bedrooms over twelve hundred. Well, this is the beginning. You'll get the list of the price list, and you have the option to appeal the process. The rental prices are compared to HUD and fair market rent values, and if you. 
They won't give me a formula of exactly what reduced price would be or reduced income. It just to the criteria what HUD requires for low income housing. Now it could be from credit to debit ratio, uh, just your income, post post storm income. To expedite the process, instead of we've contacted them, instead of waiting for to get the letter and do the appeal process, it takes 30 days or longer. But it's still telling everyone you're liable for the rent that is due on April 1st. Now, April 1st is for the lower survivors. May 1st will be for the Delta survivors. So I encourage everybody. Jesus. That, you know, they, they said if you can't pay the rent, you got to move out. I tell you, don't, nobody should move out. If you, you know, don't put yourself in a bind. Um, if you can't make the full payment, pay something. I hear it's $50. Just give a little something. Um, be honest with you, FEMA has no eviction powers. Okay, they'll, they'll try to get you through a penalty, attack it on. Uh, maybe eventually say you don't qualify for any funding from the federal government if you don't pay this rent money. So we try to expedite the process because I wrote them a pretty long email saying it was, it was called the mental anguish of survivors. This letter and more work, and people are really frustrated. Uh, some people had to get out of their trailer; they have to move 50 to 75 miles away and then pay rent somewhere else. So I tell everybody, stay put, don't stress, get what you can, uh, answer the phone when they call you, supply your appeal, and hopefully get produced. Now, we have a handful of survivors that can purchase these uh, MHUs and TTs. Um, they still haven't come up with a, a market value on those. Now, we did put a request to sell them at 4000 for the travel trailers, 6000 for the mobile homes. We still haven't got an answer on it, but that's our request. And we're doing this collectively with uh, Laura, Delta, and I statewide. Because the state really, me and the state's working together against FEMA. Uh, we did request uh, a waiver of the rental fees. They denied it. I want to know who denied it and why. And they won't give me an answer. Keep telling my headquarters. Well, I'm going to, you know, I just don't take no for an answer. You got to, let's justify it a little bit. And they make you refer to uh, the federal regulations the statute that said they got a charge. Well, I read it. It just says FEMA may begin charging. It don't say must or shall. So I'm on the who made the decision to start charging now. Because they did authorize the extension of six months. To me, that, that extension should, everything should stay in place for another six months, added to the 18. Well, they tweaked it up. So anyway, we're playing the FEMA dance again. Uh, but if talk to you uh, constituents, just tell them don't move out. If they can pay 50 bucks, no matter what FEMA says, the state keep going in until they get a, an agreed price. Yeah, well, we'll, well, I feel like we ought to be careful when we say that because I've uh, I've been around enough times with FEMA. They always uh, the federal government always uh, they they always mm -hmm. get what they want at the end. I mean, I've been around where. They said, oh, don't worry about that, don't worry about that. But down the road, they had to worry about that. No, but I'm not saying no, I'm don't not. worry about it. I'm just saying if you can't afford don't don't move out. No, you I'm not saying evicted. that. I'm and, just and saying we'll be penalized in some shape or form or they will cut you off some funding. You know, but a lot of people get really stressed. They have no place to go for these few months. And well, they have to realize this is not a permanent housing solution, but it does buy them a little bit more time. You know, so instead of not paying anything, give a little something if you can't make the dollar amount that they want to, and then you get adjusted. But they're not fast on the process. They tell you to do these things, and as a matter of fact, they sent the letter two weeks after the deadline for you to make a decision, uh, and a determination what you want to do, two weeks after they tell you you had to make up your mind. Okay? So it's on their part. Plus, it's all about sidestepping and delay. They send a letter to tell you you got to pay the rent. You read the whole letter, they don't tell you where to send the money. Right. There's nowhere on the letter where to send the paper. Yep. So we call them. Okay, so now the tenant will get a bill from FEMA. Just wait on the bill. You know, and don't pay me because they won't see the money. But just, just pay when you get your bill through the mail. That's a, you know, Fred Emerson said, go put it back in the mailbox. <laughs> 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 but that, that's how it's going to work. So. Uh, we've been handling those calls with that. Just trying to keep people just, you know, we, we're tired of saying patient, but we have to be patient. But I'm telling nobody, don't move. Now, some are able to, to move on our own. We try to get where if the rent could be applied to the purchase price of the trailer, and they won't let that fly. 
So there's a handful that can buy them right now instead of spending money on rent and purchase the unit. So, and they were supposed to have a, uh, a price today, but they, they don't have it. Imagine that. Yeah. Shocker. We can go buy it, but we don't know what we're going to charge you yet. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You'll get a bill in the mail. Now, with the head of game, the ones that uh, before you sell it, there's a whole other checklist you got to go through, especially the MSU having a special flood hazard. All right, well, we already had a game. Everybody's elevated, they got their permit. So normally if somebody wants to purchase a trailer, it takes about 30 days. We don't expedite half the requirements on the checklist, though it should be maybe two weeks if somebody wants to actually purchase that trailer. Now, there's only, the travel trailers are not going to be offered for sale anywhere in the flood zone. There's only two in our parish that's in the X zone. They'll offer to, to sell it to them, but the others, they're going to pick them up and pull them out. You're not going to rent those forever. Yeah, they're going to go park, park them in a pasture and let them rock down. Yeah, buy it for $500 that yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else, Kurt? Uh, <laughs> wait a little while. Right. I'll call you. Thank you, Danny. All right. Thank you, Danny. Okay, do you have anything else? Um, you do need to review the agenda, but while you do, I'd like to introduce our newest hire. Uh, Gary, do you mind? Go into the mic. Gary Johnson is the first parish engineer in history. I, I know it's taken us a long time to get to this point, but we're really excited about it. And he actually started um, Sunday when we went towards South Lafouche Levy District to look at their levies and speak with their levy district director. So um, go ahead and introduce yourself, Gary. I'm Gary Johnson. I've uh, worked with most of y'all over the last 10, 12 years throughout my career. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'd like to see where we can head with the parish from here. So, uh, if y'all have any questions or anything at this time? Don't leave because you, you're the first question on the review agenda for me. Uh, <laughs> if we're moving into that, anybody else got anything? If we're moving into that, I'm going to ask you my question. Uh, on permits, B, Apollo Energy. I'm talking about bringing in some mechanical uh, booms or mechanical uh, to hold a spill back. Uh, have they cleared that with the drainage boards? I mean, do you know? I'm not familiar yet. Uh, yeah. I'll with, uh, I'm just not getting into all the projects. This is actually an emergency use authorization. Right. So I think the work's already been done. Okay, so they're doing it after the fact. And but the was what asking, was your question, Mr. Sonica? My biggest question was if this is mechanical, they said mechanical. Two mechanical barriers. I want to know if I was going to restrict access because there's other people that move through that canal besides uh, Apollo. Oh, okay. So if it's already done. Yeah. The question's moot, but uh, anyway, I just thought I'd quiz my new engineer. <laughs> I'm going to check it out. Then we fill it in a lot more here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hold your rock under the rug right there. Sorry. Okay, I'm ready for it. <clears throat> That's why I know him from. He worked with our drainage board a lot. So uh, he, he's probably more familiar with the Gamble Daniel Canal than I am. Try to be careful with him, though. When he start that. Well, I'll let you know in a couple weeks. <laughs> hey, man. You did politics now. <laughs> Two weeks. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Welcome aboard. Welcome. <clears throat> See if you smiling like that next year. Yeah, or next week. <laughs> Anything else? I have three add-ons, Mr. President. Yes, um, the first one's going to be an appointment for Waterworks District Number 7. We received um, a resignation letter from Mr. Guy Murphy, so they want to appoint Mr. Gabe Lalon to that position for his remainder of term. We have a change order for the pump back here. It's an additional charge of $57,650 to replace the existing pump with a 24-inch low-lift pump. Um, it's going to be 8 to 20 weeks for the pump to come in. It was unforeseen when they pulled the other pump. It had pumped in rocks and it all broke up. Broke and the third one is President Authority to sign the Cooperative Endeavor Agreement with the library and the sheriff for the building in Hackberry. That was the old library that the Sheriff's Department chosen. The library owns the building. The police jury owns the land and the police jury is going to continue for the building to be under its blanket policy and bill the sheriff for that amount of money. So we have to be on the cooperative endeavor agreement with why, the why, situation. Why are we going to do it that way? Because the, the building right now is below BFE, 
and in order for him to save some money on insurance of the building he can leave it under our blanket policy and stay fully covered and just bill him for the amount that we normally pay instead of him going out and getting new insurance policies and everything so he's agreed to that so we're going to bill him for the insurance if y'all agree to that mr tom's working on the cooperative endeavor now so if y'all want him to carry his own insurance we can put that in there most definitely if y'all want to leave him under the blanket policy and allow us to just bill him for whatever our cost is we can also do that i think everybody's good with it okay. and that's the only three i have okay katie next month can we have an update on our buildings especially our uh, maintenance borns especially the one in grand lake yes sir where are we at I did receive the first draft of the construction documents yesterday, actually. I, have them. I can print them up and I'll take a look at them today before you leave. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay. We're going to call this meeting adjourned. We're going to move into... Take two or three minutes. Five minute break. Two or three minutes. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take two or three minutes for the